to build upon a, a continuity of what has been done already. What I know for a fact is that um, Baumia would A driver of his own, uh, if he's able to put his messages across clearly and well. Taxes and the economic. Uh, That we are facing. What I'm very certain is that Al Haji Dr. Mahmoud Baumia mm. is not going to be a continuation of this administration as a president. His digitalization agenda, mm -hmm. which is very clear, mm -hmm. all of us today can sit in our homes and do transactions digitally. Today, the police service, the National Ambulance Service, are able to trace the residence of people, obviously because of a digitalized process mm -hmm. that he put in place. So some of these things are very important, but for tonight, it is about what new, what special, what uniqueness, what new energy is al to Dr. Mahmoud Baumia bringing on board, moving into the 2024 elections. One of the profound statements he made prior to the 2016 general elections was moving from taxation to production. How have we fared? Well, I think it, it, it began with a process. Uh, but obviously, along the way, you know we had challenges. I would say that um, in the first three years of the Akufuado administration, we were very clear on our minds that this is a government that knows exactly what it is doing. Our GDP records were improving. We recorded digital you know, figures in terms of the indices and all that. But of course, we all know the challenges that hit us. And obviously, these are challenges that hit everywhere uh, in the world. But in terms of an industrialized Ghana, that is what we are all looking out for. I think Ghanaians are going to be very specific in terms of how Al Haji, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, will be able to transition from an Ekufuado led administration into his own personal administration that will not bring any kind of uh, contradiction whatsoever. It is going to be positivity. The man that I know is someone who is very focused in humility. He does it on a very quiet, and I'm very certain that he's also learned a lot, obviously. When you work with somebody for a long time, knowing the strength of Nana Adodankwa Ekufu Ado and how focused he is, I mean, as a presidential candidate, his, mission, his vision and mission were very consistent. His message in 2008 was not different from his message in 2012, and it wasn't different from his message in 2016. And I think we have all come to learn that consistency in politics works in one way or the other, especially if you have the people who would push your dreams and he aspirations about forward. His messages. One of the messages was uh, he didn't believe in taxing mobile money. We have not heard him speak about the e-levy. Will he speak about the e-levy? Will he shy away from the position of the current government? I don't think it, is, it will be good for me to say exactly the things that he But he's saying you know the man. Yeah, you know what? All right. Give his it. message yeah. for tonight, it is something exclusive to him. Mm. And we are all waiting to see exactly and hear exactly what. New Al Haji right. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is bringing on board tonight, and that is the expectation of all parliamentary candidates here as well. So, so that he can have a full group of 16 to 20 years, owns the MPP now. He should also start.
you the party? The, the new patriotic party understands the move, not impose people on constituencies. And I think the party machinery itself would always frown against something like that. And so, and as, as an, understand, an understander of democracy and the principles of the new patriotic party, I thought he thought it wise to be able to wait no matter how long it took for all parliamentary candidates to be elected before he delivers his message. Isn't this beautiful? A party united, a party bold and strong. Give us a wave of your Ghana flag wherever you are. First floor and second floor, the leader is about to give you a wave. The leader is about to give you a wave. The leader is about to give you a wave. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We shall remain standing. We shall remain standing as the winning by you. Sings for
That's the Yenari Asasi. Apostle in Tokyo. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for the Winnie by Youth Choir. And we are very grateful to the Winnie by Youth Choir for the patriotic pot songs ahead of this evening's engagement. We will remain standing for the opening prayer. Our colleagues in the media, please move to the media quadrant created for you. Shall we pray? Father God, we gather here today under your care and protection. We thank you for everyone here present and those still on their way. We want to thank you also for the life. Fill our words and conversation with truth and grace. And may your perfect will be done through this event. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may please resume your seats, ladies and gentlemen. We ask our colleagues in the media to kindly move to the media quadrant as we get our engagement underway. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the UPSA from where tonight the leader of the new patriotic party and the party's presidential candidate for the 2024 elections, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, will soon be addressing the Republic of Ghana. For any person seeking to lead a nation, he or she must have a bold, clear vision to express. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, running on the ticket of the new patriotic party, has a set of bold solutions to put out to the republic tonight. But he does this on the shoulders of giants. The MPP has been blessed with leaders who over the years have demonstrated bold visions for Ghana. J.B. Dankwa expressed bold visions of a democratic country with respect for rights. S.K. Dumbu expressed a vision of a robust parliament, even if it had to cost him his own leadership. K. Buzia believed in decentralization and rural development, among others. Albert Edubwahin spoke about strong governance institutions to build a strong nation. John Ajekum Kofor, among others, spoke about building 
the golden age of business. Nana Adodankwa Kufuado, among others, spoke about the free senior high school program. And for the year 2024, for the year 2024, we have a new leader. I said we have a new leader. We have a new leader in the person of Dr. Mahamudu Baumea. And he too will soon be setting out his vision for the Republic. Before he does so, I want to invite Dr. Antoine Thibodeau to acknowledge some of our key dignitaries who are Thank you, Honorable Minister. We are truly grateful to everyone who has made it here today. It is indeed a great day as we all gather to listen to the maiden speech of His Excellency, the flag bearer and leader of our great party. But we still have to mention the many who have joined us today. His Excellency, the former president of Ghana, John Ejekum Kufor, thank you for coming here today. Her Excellency, the beautiful First Lady of the Republic of Ghana, thank you for joining us today. Her Excellency, the awesome, unique, and spiritual Second Lady of Ghana, Hajia Samira Baumia, the wife of our flag bearer, thank you for joining us today. Her Excellency, Honorable Frema Akusia Opari, the Ghana's first female Chief of Staff, thank you for being with us. Members of the National Council and Elders of MPP, our National Chairman, my General Secretary and our General Secretary, former presidential aspirants and new, and of the new patriotic party, former presidential candidates, members of the diplomatic corps, distinguished traditional rulers, revered council of Zongo chiefs and elders, honorable ministers and deputy ministers of state, our religious leaders and members of the Christian council of Ghana, honorable members of parliament, our parliamentary candidates, Metropolitan, Municipal and District Chief Executives, CEOs and Deputies of all state agencies, past and present leadership of the new patriotic party from our regions and all constituencies, representatives of all political parties in Ghana, academia and heads of all institutions, civil society and non-governmental organizations, representatives of all workers' unions and other bodies, distinguished invited guests, Students, our UPSA family, the Pro VC, who is our host for today, fellow patriots from all over Ghana, our media partners from across the country, and every citizen here gathered, especially our cherished viewers on all stations and channels who are listening to us today. Our deepest appreciation for your time, for your presence, and your dedication. We promise you an exciting journey together. Thank you for joining us. And now, he is the aide to lead the majestic elephant party. He is persevering and yet extremely gentle and calm. But he has a firm hand. Your Excellencies, Honorable Members, Distinguished Invited Guests, Fellow Patriots, let us welcome with a resounding applause our national chairman, Honorable Stephen Ayesu in team. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be a very tall addressing of all the dignitaries, but I'll give it a shot. 
Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic. In the person of Al Haji, Dr. Mahmoudou. Your Excellency, former President, John Ajekun Kufo, the General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, Justin Kudya Frimpong. All protocols duly observed. I am happy to welcome all of you, those of us gathered in this auditorium and those watching through various media channels to this historic occasion. On the 4th of November, 2023, we made history, the MPP made history by electing His Excellency Dr. Alhaji Mahmoudou Baumia as the presidential candidate of the new patriotic party. Not only is he the fourth presidential candidate of the party in this dispensation, but he's also the first minority candidate. This is a testament to the party's commitment to democracy and inclusivity. By electing Dr. Baumia, we have demonstrated that we are not an exclusivist party, but one that values diversity and embraces different perspectives. I commend Dr. Mahmoud Baumia for his exceptional determination and hard work, which has earned him the well-deserved position of the MPP's presidential candidate for 2024. I congratulate him on my behalf, as well as on behalf of all the national officers most of whom are present here with us. Their continual support for the party and the democratic process is greatly appreciated. Indeed, our presence here today shows our love for the party and commitment to its values. Thank you for being part of our journey towards a better future. I want to express my sincere appreciation to the party's rank and file for their discipline and hard work in organizing the widely acclaimed, peaceful and transparent presidential and parliamentary primaries. I commend your efforts and I expect all parliamentary candidates and party executives to take immediate action by reaching out to all unsuccessful aspirants and form an formidable constituency campaign teams to guarantee our party retains its majority in the 10th parliament. Failure to do so is not an option. It is time to put aside all differences and come together. Let us bridge every gap heal every wound and work together with a renewed passion for victory. Remember, when we stand united, we are unstoppable. So, let's join hands and search or march in unity towards a resounding first round victory on December 7th.
Having said this, it is indeed possible. I don't want to take the wind out of the sail of our flag bearer. So thank you for listening. And I leave the floor. Thank you. I think we could do it better. Another round of applause for our honorable chairman. He is popularly called Ghana's gentle giant. He ruled from 2000 to 2008. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we now invite the most revered former president of Ghana for his message. Your Excellency. Members,
later became president. Today, we've all gathered here. to launch him as our presidential candidates by destiny. And please, let's all accept him to, co to continue. We happen to be living in times But I tell you, we should be talking A big round of Applause for His Excellency, the former president.
aquaculture from 4,000 to over 6,000 metric tons. We have worked very hard to make it possible for Ghana to become the headquarters of the over 40 kilometers of drains. The Tamale Airport is now an international airport. We have added, we have upgraded it to international. Opportunity to see. serve as vice president. Eleven days ago, the party also completed its election of parliamentary candidates for the 2024 elections. Let me use this opportunity to also appreciate the leadership and grassroots of our beloved party, the MPP, for the seamless organization of the parliamentary primaries following on the... I believe the time has now come for me to speak to you, the good people of Ghana, about my candidature what we have experienced as a nation, my vision and priorities, and why I believe I am the best candidate for the presidency of this country. I recognize 
that submitting myself to your I'm interviewing for a job. One needs to tell a prospective employer what he has accomplished in his previous job and how he can successfully deliver in the new position he is seeking, which is what I seek to do in this speech. Even though tonight is about sharing my vision and policy priorities, Crave your indulgence to broadly set up the context. I will first talk about the record of our government and my contribution as vice president before I lay out my vision. So I ask for your patience. Ladies and gentlemen, when we assumed office in 2017, we were confronted with an economy with declining economic growth along with several problems and challenges. A graphic description time was provided by the former president and my main opponent for the 2024 presidential election who announced to the nation that the meat was finished and the economy was left with bones. Notwithstanding the difficult economy we inherited, we had to get on with it and start to fix the problems. We started with a clear, decisive, and deliberate program to, among other things, stabilize the economy, fix DUMSO, fix the national health insurance, scare the arrears, make education free and accessible, significantly enhance social protection for the vulnerable in society, industrialize our economy, tackle youth employment, unemployment, and empower farmers. Between In 
indicators such as economic growth result of revenue declines in the midst of increased expenditures during COVID. In addition, our debt became unsustainable. Along with many emerging economies, Ghana lost access to international capital market financing. This resulted in a balance of payments crisis as Ghana had to continue to honor its debt obligations energy payments and the import bill. We faced a serious global and domestic economic crisis. There were many who predicted that we were going to end up like the situation in Sri Lanka with fuel shortages, food shortages, inability to pay workers, doom so, anarchy and chaos. Indeed, Ghanaians were hit hard by rising food prices, increased exchange rate depreciation, and rising fuel prices, and rising transportation fares. Bond holders also saw a sharp decline in their net worth following the painful debt restructuring program. We faced very challenging times, but with calm leadership and the support and understanding of the good people of Ghana, we have weathered the storm. The government had to seek IMF support to stabilize our economy and restore fiscal and debt sustainability over three years. I must, at this stage, salute and give particular recognition to the Bank of Ghana, which has come under unfair criticism for taking the necessary measures which help pull the economy back from the brink. The Bank of Ghana provided needed financing to the government at that critical moment. What the Bank of Ghana did was very responsible in putting the interest of the good citizens of Ghana first. The data which is available shows that the financing provided by, to the government by the Bank of Ghana was temporary. The Bank of Ghana has provided zero financing to government in five out of the last seven years. Zero financing in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2021, and 2023. The Bank of Ghana financing of government in the COVID-19 year of 2020 and the liquidity crisis year of 2022 was because of the domestic and global crisis with underperforming revenue and no access to international capital markets. Ladies and gentlemen, the good news is that the data shows that the economy is recovering from the crisis we face. Inflation has declined from 54% in January last year to 23% in December 
2023. Economic growth is rebounding. Spending is under control. And the fiscal deficit as a percentage of GDP has declined from 10.8% in 2020 to 4.2% in 2023. The debt to GDP ratio, after increasing from 61.2% in 2019 to 76.6% in 2021, has declined to 66.4% in 2023. And the exchange rate depreciation has also slowed down sharply since February 2023. Whereas the exchange rate depreciated by 30% in 2022, between February and December 2023, the exchange rate depreciated by only 9%. Ladies and gentlemen, what is remarkable is that notwithstanding the domestic and global crisis that we have experienced, between 2020 and 2022, the economic performance as measured by the key economic indicators such as GDP growth, agricultural growth, industry growth, trade balance, exchange rate depreciation, lending rates, international gross international reserves, and jobs. The performance of all these key indicators is better under our government than that of the 2013 to 2016 period when there was no global crisis when there was no global crisis let me give you two examples for the sake of time you look at agricultural growth and the stronger gdp growth performance in 2017 to 2022 period is underpinned by a strong agricultural GDP growth, which increased from an average of 2.9% between 2013 and 2016 to an average of 6% between 2017 and 2022. We have done double what we inherited, notwithstanding the crisis. We have made a lot of progress in agriculture even though there is more to be done. Rice imports, for example, have declined by 45% from 805,000 metric tons to 440,000 metric tons between 2021 and 2023. The goal is to be a net exporter of rice by 2028. It is clear that some of our policy interventions, such as planting for food and jobs, have borne fruit. I now tackle exchange rate depreciation. On the performance of the city exchange rate, it is also interesting to note that between 2013 and 2016, just before we came into office, the city depreciated by an average of 17.7% annually. But since 2016, between 2017 and 2020, there was a significant decline in city depreciation to an average of 7.5%. The average city depreciation further declined to 6.8% between 2017 and 2021. However, the 30% depreciation of the city in 2022 resulted in the average depreciation of the city between 2017 and 2022 to be 10.75%. So again, notwithstanding the domestic and global economic crisis, the depreciation of the city under our government is lower than that we inherited from the 2013 to 2016 period. Let me talk about jobs. What is probably 
the most remarkable development in terms of the economy is that our government has created 2.1 million jobs between 2017 and 2022. Notwithstanding the global economic crisis, the public sector recruited 1.2 million people, while the private sector uh, created 975,000 jobs, according to SNIT data. We recruited 100,000 more, more health workers, 100,000 more teachers, we more than doubled the fire service personnel, and so on. Our government clearly has created more jobs in the last seven years than any other government in the Fourth Republic. This is truly remarkable under the circumstances, even though we still have to create more jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, clearly, notwithstanding the economic crisis, this government has been able to steer the ship of the nation away from catastrophe. <coughs> in the face, in the face of the crisis, overall performance of the economy in areas such as GDP growth, agricultural growth, industrial growth, trade balance, gross international reserves, and job creation has demonstrated resilience. Ladies and gentlemen, avail available data also shows that notwithstanding the challenging economy we inherited and the global economic crisis that ensued, government has chalked a large number of achievements across the country. Due to the constraints of time, I will only be able to enumerate a few of these achievements. However, government will soon outdoor our performance tracker in the next few weeks, which will detail all of our achievements in every sector and every district in the Republic of Ghana. But I will name just a few of the achievements. We have undertaken a major road construction and rehabilitation program across the country. Over 11,674 kilometers of roads, according to data from the Ministry of Roads and Highways. I am not aware of any government that has done as much in the road sector since 1992. We have initiated and overseeing the construction and rehabilitation of more railways than any other government since 1992. At Chimota in Sawam, Accra Tema, Kojokrum Takwa, Kojokrum Manso, and Tema Mpakada. We have extended the rural telephony network to more areas than any other government since 1992. We have increased the network from 78 sites to 1,008 sites. We have constructed more fish landing sites than any other government. Exim, Dixcove, Moree, Mumford, Teshi, Keta, Osu, Ekumfi, and Mfansiman. Ladies and gentlemen, our government has constructed more sports facilities than any other government since 1992. We have completed six new multi-purpose sports stadia and four ongoing in each of the ten regions, um, all ten old regions. We completed the University of Ghana Stadium in Legon, built... constructed more infrastructure and implemented more development policies in the Zongo communities 
than any other government since 92. The Zongo Development Fund has completed over 200 infrastructure projects in Zongo communities. for sickle cell patients. Ladies and gentlemen, we provided free electricity to lifeline consumers and a 50% discount to other consumers for a whole year during COVID-19. It is important, and it is very important that you hear this, that between 2009 and 2016, the average annual increase in the electricity tariffs was 50% a year between 2009 and 2016. Average annual increase was 50% a year. Between 2017 and 2023, on the other hand, the average annual increase has been 11.1%. This is the lowest average annual increase in end user. to office in December 2016 to solve many of the systemic problems and challenges that our citizens were facing and which we had highlighted in our manifesto. For example, there was no unique identity, no property address system, fake birth certificates, and so on. We had lived with many of these problems since independence. For me, to lead is to solve. Indeed, indeed, all my adult life, my biggest motivation is about finding solutions. Solutions that improve lives. Solutions that make public services efficient and accessible, solutions that make society progress, solutions that protect the public purse, 
solutions that make our businesses competitive. I derive my greatest satisfaction from solving problems, and I have done so whenever I am given the opportunity, and will do more if I am given the mandate to do so. I had long held the view that many of these problems facing the economy could be resolved through digitalization. In fact, in my 2010 book on monetary policy and financial sector reform in Africa, I proposed digitalization amongst others as the way forward for African countries. So when we assumed office in 2017, as Vice President, I made the decision with the blessings and support of the President to focus on the critical but underdeveloped systems that would expand the economy, improve systems, and create jobs through digitalization. Therefore, as the finance minister oversees the budget through fiscal policy, the governor of the central bank also focused on monetary and exchange rate policy. I focus on the complementary data and systems improvement that would ensure the ease of doing business and change the fundamentals of the economy, making it more dynamic and responsive to modern trends and the management of it more scientific and efficient. Ladies and gentlemen, I was thankfully appointed as chairman of the economic management team as a subcommittee of, to cabinet, we do not have any decision-making powers, but I am very proud of the quality of advice we have been providing over the years to cabinet. As vice president, I was asked by the president to assist in solving some of the problems that were inhibiting the transformation of Ghana's economy. My approach was to help formalize the economy through digitalization as stated in our 2016 manifesto. This is why my office has had oversight responsibility for many of the government's digitalization projects. We can only build a vibrant nation if we have strong systems and institutions that work. Very soon, artificial intelligence will transform the world. How are we preparing Ghana for this new phenomenon. I will now come to how we are using digitalization to transform the economy and preparing our society to be competitive as Africa is busily becoming the largest single market in the world with its 1.4 billion people. Ladies and gentlemen, a major problem that we had as a country was the absence of a unique identity for citizens and residents. With oversight from my office, the National Identification Authority moved very quickly with the issuance of the biometric national ID cards, the Ghana card, to the population. The Ghana card project was initiated by President Kufuo. So far, some 17 million people have been enrolled on the Ghana card by the NIA. I'd like to note that between 2007 and 2016, only 900,000 Ghana cards were issued. With the Ghana card, the identity of the people, even dead people can be established using their fingerprints. With the Ghana card, every Ghanaian, regardless of locations or status, whether rich or poor, now can be officially registered and recognized as a Ghanaian. Before this, it was possible for someone to be born, live and die in Ghana without ever being registered. 
identity fraud, age cheating, football age, people cheating on their retirement age, fake birth certificates, fake passports will no longer be possible with the Ghana card. Today, because your Ghana card is linked to your bank account and your SIM card, people cannot just go and borrow money from the bank and disappear and appear with a new name as used to happen. And this led to higher interest rates. The Ghana card can also be used to travel from abroad into Ghana from 44,000 airports in the world. The Ghana card is a major element in many of the digitalization initiatives that we are undertaking. That is why its successful implementation has been so important to me. Ladies and gentlemen, to solve the problem of a lack of a working address system in Ghana, with oversight from my office, we have leveraged on GPS technology to implement a digital address system for Ghana, capturing every square inch of land or water in Ghana. Today, every property in Ghana has a unique digital address, along with street names and house numbers. And finding directions to any location is now very easy. Ladies and gentlemen, we faced a major problem of a very few people having access to financial services. To solve this problem, I championed the implementation of mobile money interoperability. Mobile money interoperability has made it possible to transfer money seamlessly across different mobile money providers and between bank accounts and mobile wallets. Today, because of mobile money interoperability, you can transfer money from a customer of one mobile money service provider to a customer of a different mobile money service provider and also make payments from your mobile money account into any bank account. And you can receive payments from any bank account into your mobile money account. Ladies and gentlemen, you can do this 24 hours a day. Apart, apart from in achieving financial inclusion, mobile money interoperability, has also significantly promoted a cashless culture, especially by our market women and the business community, thus reducing robberies and attacks on market women and business folks on our highways. Robbers, armed robbers used to attack vehicles carrying traders, knowing they were carrying cash. But now, many traders don't carry cash because they keep their monies on their mobile wallets for seamless transactions wherever they are. Today, because of mobile money interoperability, you can also receive remittances from abroad directly onto your mobile wallet without the need to go to a bank or Western Union money transfer. Because of mobile money, because the mobile money account performs just like a bank account uh, as a result of mobile money interoperability, over 90% of Ghanaian adults have mobile money accounts that function just like bank accounts. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have basically solved the problem of financial exclusion in Ghana. The state of inclusive instant payment report has ranked Ghana as the number one in Africa in terms of access to financial inclusion. Number one in the whole of Africa. Today, because of digitalization, anyone can do banking 
and digital financial transactions 24 hours a day. The data, the data shows that at the end of 2016, the total cumulative value of mobile money transactions was 78.5 billion Ghana cities at the end of 2016. Following mobile money interoperability, the total cumulative value of mobile money transactions has increased from 78.5 billion to 1.9 trillion cities in 2023. Therefore, between 2016 and 2023, following mobile money interoperability, Momo transactions have increased by 2,335%. A 23-fold increase. This is why Ghana continues to be the fastest growing mobile money market in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, the digital payments infrastructure that we have put in place is boosting e-commerce in Ghana. Businesses are booming over Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and so Many people who could not afford to rent or build shops. Ghana is currently ranked number six in Africa in terms of e-commerce. Number six in Africa, behind Mauritius, Nigeria, South Africa, Tunisia, and Morocco, according to AMTA. Ladies and gentlemen, addressing corruption in the public service, our approach to improving delivery of public services is to minimize human contact as much as possible. <clears throat> Therefore, we embark on an aggressive digitalization of processes of service delivery across many public institutions with coordination from my office. When you look at the passport office, we have digitalized the passport office with oversight from office. We, with digitalization, the average turnaround for acquisition of passports has been significantly reduced. And today, because of digitalization of the passport office, you can apply for your passport online from your home 24 hours a day. The digitalization of the passport application process has resulted in a major increase in the number of passports processed annually, as well as the revenue yield to the passport office. In 2018, the total number of passports issued was 346,911, and the revenue generated in 2018 was 11.8 million. By 2023, following digitalization, the passport office issued 751,761 passports with revenue of 94 million Ghana cities. The ultimate objective is to eradicate human interface in all phases of the passport application process to give true meaning to the online filing and processing of forms. I will come back to this issue of passport shortly when I get into my vision and priorities. Then we went to the ports. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, previously the bureaucracy in the claim of goods at Ghana sports involved a lot of paperwork which used to be largely manual. This caused delays, corruption, inefficiencies, frust frustration and loss of revenue to government. Many citizens who had cleared goods at the country's ports 
had horror stories about their experiences at the port. With oversight from my office, the introduction of a paperless port system has reduced layers and simplified the process, reduced the time needed to clear goods and the avenues for corruption, and increased efficiencies and revenue mobilization at the port. Digitalization has also taking place at the Drivers and Vehicle Licensing Authority, which offers two traditional services, driver licensing and vehicle registration services. And today, um, the office services that DVLA is offering can be matched, well, and they're just world class. They can be matched to any other country. Ladies and gentlemen, my office also worked with the National Insurance Commission to implement the Moto Insurance Database. The objective of the introduction of the Moto Insurance Database is to provide more safeguards for the millions of Ghanaians who, tra who travel by road by ensuring that vehicles are insured. It also curbs the menace of vehicles with fake motor insurance stickers plying our roads and thus endangering lives and property. With digitalization of the motor insurance in Ghana, members of the public can now self-check the authenticity of their insurance policy by dialing a USSD code, star 920, star 57 hash, and follow the instructions. You put in the number, it will tell you whether the car is insured or is not insured. So, Today, you can know the status of the vehicle, is the insurance status of any vehicle, 24 hours a day. Today, because of digitalization, you can also apply for insurance for your vehicle on your mobile phone and receive your insurance sticker electronically. And you can do this 24 hours a day. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, with oversight from my office, we have digitized the births and deaths registry. And we have just completed the integration of the births and deaths registry with the database this of the Ghana Health Service and the National Identification Authority so that the record of deaths and deaths would be consistent across all of these databases. Starting this quarter, in fact, I will launch this in a few weeks, but starting this quarter, newborn children in Ghana will be given a Ghana card number. But the actual Ghana card will be issued when the child is six years old, when his or her biometrics are fully formed. So we are bringing a brochure to Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, in the past, candidates applying for a scholarship usually had to travel from all parts of Ghana to Accra to take part uh, in the application process. This caused a great deal of inconvenience for applicants seeking government sponsorships. The manual processes of the scholarship secretariat resulted in an inefficient administration of scholarships in the country. With the digitalization of the scholarship secretariat, candidates can now apply for scholarship from the comfort of their homes 24 hours a day and take aptitude tests and be interviewed by their own in their own districts. The Ghana.gov platform. Ladies and gentlemen, to make it easy to access government services, I led the initiative to establish the Ghana.gov platform, which was implemented with oversight from of my office. The Ghana.gov platform is a one-stop shop for accessing government services. So far, 
out of the 1,516 ministries, departments, and agencies targeted, we have onboarded 1,503 of them onto the Ghana.gov platform for e-government services. So 99% of MMDAs have been onboarded on the Ghana.gov platform. All payments on the Ghana.gov platform go directly into the government accounts to ensuring transparency. Since 2020, a total of 201 billion Ghana CDs has been collected for government on the platform. For services onboarded and receiving payments, you should be able to apply for and obtain any government service online through the Ghana.gov platform 24 hours a day. Digitalization has therefore dealt a severe blow to correct the corruption involved in the collection of payments by different institutions for government. The progress Ghana has made in the provision of e-government services is remarkable. According to the UNDP 2022 e-governance index, Ghana is ranked number one in West Africa and number four in the whole of Africa in terms of e-governance. And we are ahead of countries such as Rwanda, Botswana, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Kenya, and Uganda. With oversight from my office, ladies and gentlemen, digitalization at the Electricity Company of Ghana has allowed the buying of electricity credit on your mobile phone through the mobile ECG app. This has provided relief to customers who no longer have to queue for long hours to buy electricity units. Also, for people whose credit runs out at odd hours, they can purchase electricity credit on their mobile phones 24 hours a day. Now, for people who need a new service or a separate meter from ECG, they can also apply online 24 hours a day. 3.5 million people are on the ECG app. And as a result of digitalization, ECG's monthly revenue collections have increased from 450 million Ghana cities a month to 1.2 billion Ghana cities a month. Ladies and gentlemen, Ghana has a major challenge in the area of domestic revenue mobilization. The tax to GDP ratio is about 14%, compared to 27% for South Africa and 34% for the advanced OECD countries. Most adults in Ghana are outside the tax net and compliance is very low. At the beginning of 2017, only 4%, 4% of the population of Ghana had tax identification numbers. To increase the number of people with tax identification numbers, I propose that we designate the Ghana car as the tax identification number. In doing this, we have increased the percentage of adults with tax identification numbers from 4% to 85%. It is now incumbent on the GRA to use this database in tax collection to broaden the, the tax net. Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, with oversight from my office, the SNIT, National Health Insurance, GRA, Controller and Counter General Payroll, DVLA, SIM cards, and bank accounts have all NIA database linked to the Ghana card. Today, your SNIT number is your Ghana card number. Your NHIS number is your Ghana card number. Your TIN number is your Ghana card number. The integration of the database says is allowing us to successfully weed out ghost workers on payroll. A 
biometric audit of the National Service Scheme payroll found about 44,707 ghost workers and potential ghost workers between 2022 and 2024. And this has saved Ghana a total of 356 million Ghana CDs. Also, SNIT has suspended payment of 480 million Ghana CDs to 29,000 ghost pensioners using the Ghana card system. Ladies and gentlemen, we have also recently integrated the controller and accountant general payroll database with the NIA database to eliminate ghost workers on government payroll. Through digitalization, we have finally been able to solve the long-standing problem of ghost workers on government payroll. Ladies and gentlemen, many people, including highly educated people, find the process of filing taxes complex. To make it easier and less cumbersome to file taxes, I challenge the GRA to come up with a simple to use mobile app to enable ordinary people to file and pay taxes using their mobile phones. And this has been done. Today, you can file your taxes 24 hours a day on your mobile phone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in the area of healthcare, digitalization of hospital medical records, to make healthcare easily accessible across the country, we have overseen the connection of health facilities under the Ghana Health Service onto one digital platform. So far, all teaching hospitals all regional hospitals and all district hospitals have been connected and can talk to each other. The goal is to network over 90% of all hospitals in Ghana by the end of next year. So currently, if you are referred from a hospital like Tamale Teaching Hospital to Kolebu Teaching Hospital, you do not need to carry a folder. All your records will be seen and monitored by the doctor in Kolebu when you arrive. Patients will have only one digital folder wherever they go. Your health records can be accessed 24 hours a day from any of the 302 network hospitals. Ladies and gentlemen, digitizing the operations of the National Health Insurance Authority has helped to reduce fraudulent claims. The renewal of all national health insurance registrations used to take place at various NHIA district health offices. This led to backlogs and long queues. In some instances, people slept for days at some district hospitals. These delays hampered the operations and limited the revenue streams of the NHIA. With oversight from my office, we have digitalized the enrollment and renewal of the National Health Insurance membership. Following digitalization, renewal of National Health Insurance registration via mobile phone can now take place 24 hours a day. And this has eliminated the bottlenecks that were there. I now come to drones. Ladies and gentlemen, I remember with so much pain when my father underwent an operation in Tamale Teaching Hospital. He was losing blood that night and the doctors were trying to get blood for him. We rushed to the hospital blood bank but it was closed. I tried to get the phone number of the one in charge and made several calls, but he did not pick up. We were running against time, and by the morning, my father had died. That painful experience is forever with me. So when I heard about zip line drone in an emergency, 
I was determined to get it for God, to save many lives that are needlessly lost. I went to Silicon Valley in the USA and I had a meeting with the co-founder of Zipline, Robert Keller, and convinced him to set up Zipline in Ghana. When I announced the imminent arrival of Zipline in Ghana, our friends in the opposition said that the drones were for taking pictures of women in their bathrooms. Ladies and gentlemen, previously, hospitals and clinics in remote and largely rural communities like Nyangosra in Afajato South, Afram Plains, Yagaba, or Yunyo had difficulty of getting medical supplies, especially in times of emergencies involving snake bites, childbirth, blood loss, floods, and so on. Many lives are needlessly lost because the hospitals are unable to access critically needed supplies on time. To address this problem, Ghana opted to partner Zipline, the world's largest automated on-demand delivery service for medical supplies. We've established six Zipline distribution centers in Omanako, in the eastern region, in Panya, Ashanti, Mampong, Vopsi in northeast region, Sechuyoso, Kete Krachi, Enum, and Zipline has made millions of deliveries of medicines, blood, and vaccines to many remote parts of Ghana and has saved many lives. Ladies and gentlemen, Zipline services are available 24 hours a day. I should add, I should add rather proudly that Ghana is currently has the largest medical drone delivery service in the whole world. The whole world. What is even more impressive, more impressive, is that the drone centers are 100% manned by young, talented Ghanaians. They are manning all of the drones. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2019, I challenged the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana during their annual meeting in Ho to go digital and place all pharmacies in Ghana on a digital platform for ease of access by Ghanaians. The Pharmacy Council, in collaboration with the private sector, has completed the work on a digital pl platform for all pharmacies in Ghana. Basically, the National Electronic Pharmacy Platform will offer the opportunity for everybody through a mobile phone to upload your prescriptions and find out which pharmacies near you have the medicines. Secondly, you can compare the prices of the same drug offered by the different pharmacies and decide where you want to order from. And those orders will be delivered using your digital address at home. Ghanaians will experience the e-pharmacy platform in full operation this year when every pharmacy is onboarded. E-pharmacy services will be available 24 hours a day. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last seven years, we have witnessed what some international observers have described as an extraordinary digitalization of the Ghanaian economy. But this dig extraordinary digitalization has not happened in a vacuum. We have had to put in place critical infrastructure to support digitalization. I should note that 93% of the NCAA licensed fiber optic cable in Ghana. The total license fiber optic cable is 7,234 kilometers, but 93% of that was put in place since 2017. Since 2017. In addition, we've implemented a national government cloud infrastructure, cyber security infrastructure, deployed the public key infrastructure, PKI, 
to provide another layer of security to students, to citizens, to support digitalization. Ladies and gentlemen, what is remarkable about Ghana's digitalization journey is that the various initiatives were implemented using local IT companies and local talent. It was deliberately done that way. So, ladies and gentlemen, if as my prospective employer, you ask me the question, so Dr. Baumia, you want to be president of Ghana. Can you tell us what you did for Ghana in your capacity as vice president? I will say in response that I have, with the support of the president, I've had the honor and the privilege to be given the opportunity to initiate, champion, or oversee many problem-solving policy initiatives. Many of these include many of the digitalization initiatives that I have just discussed, the no guarantor student loans with a Ghana card, one constituency, one ambulance, zip line drones, agenda 111, the Sino-Hydro Barter Agreement, provision of hydro oxyurea for sickle cell patients, Zongo Development Fund, the Bank of Ghana Gold Purchase Program, the Gold for Oil Policy, abolishing the filling of embarkation cards, go ride taxi service, the system to tackle ghost names on the public payroll, and many more. It is important, ladies and gentlemen, to note that many of the transformational policy initiatives that we have introduced since 2017 are being done for the first time since independence. What is interesting is that because many of them have not been done before, many people who think in terms of impossibility argue that they were not possible, but we have made them possible. Criticisms. Criticisms and name calling eventually gave way to reality as the nation is greatly benefiting from these initiatives. What we have been able to accomplish so far shows that it is possible for Ghana to achieve many things that some believe to be impossible. It is possible if we put our minds to it. We need to break the shackles of impossibility and embrace the mindset of possibility. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I now come to my vision. and priorities and policies if you give me the opportunity by the grace of God to become president of the Republic of Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, in this regard, I have, been, I have been engaged in a lot of consultation and doing a lot of thinking in the last few months about the lessons of the last seven years as well as my vision and priorities as I seek to become President of the Republic of Ghana. Clearly, the initial conditions that we inherited in 2017 are not the same as will be in 2025. Therefore, my priorities will be different. We have done many good things and I will be seeking to build upon them. My vision, ladies and gentlemen, is to create a tent big enough to accommodate all our people, 
to tap into the resourcefulness and talent of our people, irrespective of our different ethnic, political, and religious backgrounds, to channel our energies into building the kind of country that assures food, self-sufficient, safe, prosperous, and a dignified future for all Ghanaians. To create sustainable jobs with meaningful pay for all and for Ghana to participate fully in the fourth industrial revolution using systems and data. To realize this vision, we must have a mindset of possibilities and not impossibilities. The challenges we must overcome as a country are too important to let our political differences derail us. There is a critical failure of mindset that manifests itself in the absence of core values, patriotism, and principles within our society. We, we need to invigorate the can-do spirit of the Ghanaian, to believe that we can do better than we have ever imagined if we put our minds to it. For example, our student from Manfi High School, Prempe College, have won international robotic competitions against their peers in the US, Germany, and South Korea. We must apply the same mindset of beating the world in robotics, singathons, and cookathons to every sphere of economic activity. We must believe, we must believe that it is possible. This must be inculcated in our children from home and in school. This is why we are going to introduce a growth mindset curriculum in our schools to help students build critical skills such as problem solving, risk taking, opportunity spotting, and design thinking. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in the area of macroeconomic stability, a major goal of my government would be to sustain and sustain macroeconomic stability with low inflation, low interest rates, exchange rate stability, and low budget deficits. In terms of prudently managing our expenditures, to reduce the budget deficit and interest rates, my government will enhance fiscal discipline through an independent fiscal responsibility council enshrined in the Fiscal Responsibility Act 2018, Act 982. The Fiscal Responsibility Act will also be amended to add a fiscal rule that requires that budgeted expenditure in any year does not exceed 105% of the previous year's tax revenue. This will, be, this will prevent the experience of budgetary expenditures based on optimistic revenue forecasts, which many a time do not materialize. Ladies and gentlemen, furthermore, my government will reduce the fiscal burden on government by leveraging the private sector. Under the two-term administration of my boss, His Excellency Nana Dodankwa Kufuado's government, we have put in place many social safety nets like free SHS, free TVET, and so on. With all these social safety nets in place, my government will now focus on jobs and wealth creation by the private sector for all Ghanaians. My administration. <laughs> My administration. Thank you. Will incentivize the private sector to complement 
in the provision of many infrastructure and other services to reduce government expenditure and improve maintenance. The private sector will be encouraged to build roads, schools, hostels and houses for government to rent or lease to hold. The demand for roads construction is massive and this has historically placed a huge burden on the budget. I believe that the private sector should finance the construction and maintenance of roads through PPP concession arrangements. Also, the government will move towards leasing rather than purchasing vehicles, printing equipment and so on. The private sector will have the responsibility for maintaining the vehicles and the equipment. With this approach, government can save very significant outright cash out expenditure annually from, um, from various items across different ministries, departments and agencies. This policy will energize the private sector and create many jobs. Enhancing the role of the private sector along with fiscal and administrative decentralization, improving our systems and the way our institutions function will lead to greater efficiency, cutting waste and ensuring value for money in procurement. The move towards private sector provision of many public services would create the fiscal space of at least 3% of GDP annually. This represents a major paradigm shift. Additionally, an efficient system of government will require even fewer ministers. I would have, therefore, no more than 50 ministers and deputy ministers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about our tax system. To increase government tax revenue, we have to reform and refocus the Ghana Revenue Authority towards broadening the tax base. Unfortunately, the pressure that is placed on GRA staff to collect revenues makes them focus on existing tax payers. Sometimes, they even have to go and sit in people's shops to monitor sales, a process known as invigilation. In fact, many businesses feel harassed by this process and the constant audits of their operations. So this has to stop. We must strike the right balance between collecting revenue and allowing businesses to thrive. Our job is to protect the productive forces. The World Bank has estimated that revenues amounting to 13% of GDP that is 24 billion US dollars in 2023 are not collected because people are outside the tax net. Even collecting half or a quarter of this annually will be a game changer for our public finances. To do this, we need to inculcate and enforce a culture of people filing their tax returns. Incentives must be provided to encourage people to file their tax returns, even if they will pay zero taxes. We need a fresh start. The current tax regime has been with us since independence, and it has failed us. Many people do not pay taxes, including property taxes. Too much discretion results in corruption. We want a tax regime that is easy to understand, easy to comply with, and easy to enforce. And that is not subject to so much discretion. Many individuals and businesses find our tax system cumbersome and confusing. My administration will introduce a very simple citizen and business friendly flat tax regime. A flat tax of a percentage of income for individuals and SMEs 
which constitute 98% of all businesses in Ghana, with appropriate exemption threshold to set for, to protect the poor. With a new flat tax regime, a tax return should be able to be completed in just a few minutes. We will also simplify our complicated corporate tax system and VAT regime. To start the new tax system on a clean slate, my government will provide a tax amnesty that is a complete exemption from payment of taxes for a specified period and waiving the interest and penalties up to a certain year to individuals and businesses for failures to file taxes in previous years so that everybody will start afresh. Digitalization will be implemented across all aspects of tax administration. Everyone will be required to file a very simple tax return electronically through their mobile phone or computer. There will be no manual or paper filing of taxes under my administration. Assessments by GRA will also be faceless. Faceless assessments will provide transparency and accountability. There will be no need to send GRA to officers to go and sit in shops. E-invoicing as being implemented by the GRA will be extended to all companies. Estonia, India, and Mexico provide very useful models for Ghana in the area of tax digitalization. Ladies and gentlemen, in addition, any audits by GRA will also be done electronically and facelessly. Furthermore, no entity will be audited more than once in five years unless anomalies are detected which the individual or company does not correct after being given the opportunity to do so. We will amend the law so that if there is a dispute about tax assessment, a binding arbitration will take place through a body constituted by institutions such as the Ghana Arbitration Center, Institute of Taxation, AGI, Institute of Chartered Accountants, Private Enterprise Foundation, Ghana Employers Association, and so on, with a mandate to resolve any appeal in a maximum of three months. This will not affect companies, however, who by their agreements have such arbitrations taking place in international jurisdictions. Ladies and gentlemen, with cuts in government expenditure, the private sector undertaking expenditure that would normally be done by government, and the new tax regime, the flat tax regime, that will enhance compliance, broaden the tax base, and increase tax revenue. With these policies, the situation we are going to face in 2025 is going to be very different from the situation we faced in 2020 and 2022. With the policy measures implemented so far, we have outperformed the IMF fiscal deficit target of 5% by attaining a fiscal deficit target of 4.2% in 2023. The new policies that I am proposing to implement in 2025 will give us the fiscal space to eliminate uh, tax, some taxes, such as the proposed VAT on electricity, if they are still on the books, the emissions tax, and the betting tax, without compromising our fiscal deficit. This, ladies and gentlemen, I want to build a Ghana where we leverage technology, data, and systems for inclusive economic growth. I want us to apply digital technology, STEM, robotics, and artificial intelligence for the transformation of agriculture, healthcare, education, manufacturing, fintech, and public de service delivery. As part of this process, it is my goal to eliminate the digital divide by achieving close to 100% internet penetration in Ghana. 
We have already made significant progress in this direction by increasing internet penetration from 34% in 2016 to 72% in 2023. So we've more than doubled internet penetration. The task in the next four years is to move from 72% to close to 100% internet penetration. It is possible. I want to see Ghana build the digital talent that we require for the fourth industrial revolution. This will mean providing digital and software skills to hundreds and of thousands of youth. This, along with other policies, will create jobs for the youth, including school dropouts. In collaboration with the private sector, we will train at least one million youth in IT skills, including software developers, to provide job opportunities worldwide. Generally, there will be an enhanced focus on TVET education. My government will also support the establishment of a national open university, Ghana, in collaboration with the private sector, with a focus on technical and vocational skills, NICT. Ladies and gentlemen, to help our youth get jobs, I believe it is time to rethink the concept of the current national service scheme. My government will propose that those who, after completion of their education, can secure jobs will be exempted from national service. <laughs> national service will no longer be mandatory, and students will have the option to decide whether to do national service or not. <laughs> this will also encourage companies to go to the campuses to recruit annually. This time they don't go because of national service. Ladies and gentlemen, to prepare our children for the fourth industrial revolution workplace, I will enhance the repositioning of the education system towards STEM, robotics, artificial intelligence, and vocational skills to cope with the demands of the fourth industrial revolution and job creation. My government will make coding and robotics standard in senior high school. The foundation for this is being laid with the provision of laptops to senior high school students very soon. Teachers have already been given the requisite training. Following the senior high school, we will also implement a one student, one laptops policy for tertiary students through the provision of a zero interest loan with a 70% discount on the cost of the laptop payable over four years for tertiary students who need laptops. <laughs> Furthermore, to become a digital hub in Africa, Ghana's telecom industry needs more investment. The cost of data for the ordinary Ghanaian has become too expensive. It goes against the very ethos of our digitalization journey. The industry cannot continue to operate at the efficiency and pricing levels of the least efficient operators. The focus has to be on the best efficiency and pricing for the consumer. I commit to working with the industry players in setting clear policy guidelines that will remove any investor uncertainty and difficulties in business planning, including the expeditious allocation of spectrum, driven more by the goal of enhancing digital inclusion and less by revenue consideration. Another area I want to tackle is reducing the cost of living. Ladies and gentlemen, a major priority of my government will be to reduce the cost of living. The cost of living in the world has increased massively following the COVID pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war. Global inflation has increased from 1.55% in 2016 to 8.7% at the end of 2022. That is average. This is a five-fold increase. In particular, 
The increase in the cost of living has been driven by increases in food prices, energy prices, housing rents, and transport prices. Therefore, any attempt to reduce the cost of living on a sustainable basis must tackle agriculture, energy, housing, and transport prices. And that is exactly what I am going to do. I want a Ghana where we attain food security through the application of technology and irrigation. Also promote the use of agricultural lime to reduce the acidity of our soils. We enhance soil fertility and get more yield from the application of fertilizer. Ghana has an abundance of limestone to do this. I will also prioritize the construction of the Pualuvu Dam by using private sector financing to grants. My administration will also work to reduce the cost of public transport between 30 and 40 percent with the adoption of electric vehicles for public transportation. The pricing formula is dominated by two variables, the price of fuel and the price of spare parts. Electric vehicles do not use Petrol or self and the spare parts are minimum. That is what will bring down the fares for electric vehicles. More importantly, transport fares for electric vehicles will be stable. And the constant and large increases of fares that we have been witnesses will become a thing of the past. And that, a housing for all policy, I will also have a major focus on the provision of public housing in the same manner that Singapore did. We will partner with the private sector to build large housing estates as we have started doing without the government having to borrow or spend. Also, the National Rental Assistance Scheme, which is working so well, will be enhanced to deal with the problem of the for rent advance of two years and more. Ladies and gentlemen, as part of the effort to reduce the cost of living, my government will implement policies to have energy self-sufficiency at reduced cost through solar and other renewables with the application of market efficiency to the energy market. We will diversify the generation mix by introducing 2,000 megawatts of solar power and additional wind power through independent power producers to reduce our dependence on oil and gas by the end of my first term in office. Introducing solar power will significantly reduce the cost of electricity. The fact that the current residential, commercial, and industrial consumer's power is still neither reliable nor competitive is the testament that the regulatory and administrative measures so far implemented have not fully achieved the objectives we have set for ourselves in dealing with the legacy issues we inherit. Therefore, like the telecom market, we shall work to bring efficiency of markets and expand competition from the more private sector participation in generation and retail. With reliable and cost competitive power, we will attract more manufacturing capacity into the country, create jobs, improve services, export more products, and support our AFCFTA strategy to improve the participation of Ghanaian industries in intra-Africa exports and trade. Ladies and gentlemen, to assist in the transition to green energy, my government will abolish import duty on solar panels so that we can bring in more. I now turn to our natural resources. Ladies and gentlemen, as president, I will usher into Ghana 
a golden age for the maximization of the benefits from our natural resources like gold, lithium, bauxite, and so on. The key to doing this is value addition and Ghanaian ownership. We need a new paradigm in natural resource contracts. Some of the key policies I will implement to maximize our benefits from our natural resources will include the formalization, regularization, and regulation of environmentally sustainable small-scale mining. About one million people are engaged in small-scale mining in Ghana. Our goal would be to help grow small-scale mining companies into large-scale companies with capacity building and assisting them to access finance for acquiring equipment. We intend to create many millionaires in the small-scale mining industries. My government will support the Minerals Commission and key stakeholders to formalize the artisanal and small-scale gold mining sector with the objective of ensuring that activities of the entire value chain are sustainably and responsibly done so that most of the gold produced by this sector can be sold to the Bank of Ghana and be eligible to be part of Ghana's gold reserves at the central bank. In line with this, we will license all miners doing responsible mining. District mining committees, including the chiefs, will provide initial temporary licenses to the miners. As long as miners mine within the limits of their licenses, that is, no mining in river bodies and so on, as long as they mine within the limits of their licenses, there will no longer be any seizure or burning of excavators. I will fully decentralize the Minerals Commission, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency, and, and ensure that they are all present in mining districts. Every Ghanaian small-scale mining operator will register under the Ghana Small Scale Miners Association with their Ghana card. We will, in collaboration with the large mining companies, convert abandoned shafts into community mining schemes, and we will open more and new community mining schemes. District mining committees should, would be responsible for reclamation and replanting, and we will institute a pension scheme for small-scale miners like we have done for cocoa farmers. We will introduce vocational and skills training on sustainable mining for small-scale miners in the curriculum of TVET institutions and provide equipment to government authorities in the mining communities to undertake reclamation of land. Ladies and gentlemen, we will also set up a state-of-the-art of, state common user gold processing units in mining districts in collaboration with the private sector. My government will also conduct an audit of all concessions with various licenses and new applications. This will allow government to know licenses that have expired and non-compliance with licensing conditions. To encourage exploration, I will abolish the VAT on exploration services, like I say, to encourage more exploration. We will establish, a, in collaboration with the private sector, a minerals development bank. Just as we have a great development bank for agriculture, we will have a minerals development bank for the miners to support the industry. We will establish through the private sector the London Bullion Market Association certified gold refinery in Ghana within four years. And all responsibly mined small-scale gold produced will be sold to the central bank, the PMMC, or the Minerals and Income Investment Fund, MIF, and will be required all the small-scale gold mined in Ghana. There will be a requirement.
refinement that they are refined before they leave God. We have to refine them before. Ladies and gentlemen, the increase in Ghana's gold reserves to support the city. Ladies and gentlemen, a major factor influencing macroeconomic stability is the consistent depreciation of the city against foreign currencies. This is usually caused by pressure on our foreign exchange reserves. Appreciably, increasing our reserves of gold at the central bank, combined with prudent fiscal policy, is therefore one of the surest ways to keep the exchange rate stable. Two policies that helped to rescue the economy from catastrophe in the recent crisis were the Bank of Ghana's gold purchase program and the gold for oil program. The domestic gold purchase program of the Bank of Ghana is a program where the central bank boosts its foreign exchange reserves by buying locally produced gold with cities. Before this program, the total of Ghana's gold reserves since independence was 8.7 tons. That's the total we held since independence. This compares to 3,352 tons for Germany, 2,814 tons for the IMF, 2,451 tons for Italy, and 8,133 tons for the United States. It did not make sense to me that Ghana, the largest gold producer in Africa, will have some of the slowest holdings of gold reserves in the world. So I proposed to the Bank of Ghana to start a gold purchase program. The gold for oil program, on the other hand, allows the payment for oil imports with gold. So importers provide cities which the Bank of Ghana uses to buy gold and pays the suppliers of the oil. This reduces the pressure on Ghana's foreign exchange reserves and stabilizes the rate. Ladies and gentlemen, it will interest you to know that since this program started, the Bank of Ghana has purchased 26 tons of gold at $1.73 billion. The government of Ghana's gold for oil program, which also started in late December 2022, has purchased 16 tons of gold at $1.06 billion that has been available for the import of petroleum products. Together, the gold for reserves and the gold for oil programs have unlocked $2.79 billion to meet external payments of the country in just over a year. These two policies have allowed us to build foreign exchange reserves and pay for critical imports like fuel, stabilize the exchange and stabilize the exchange rate. It is important to note that the 2.7 billion that we have unlocked is almost equivalent to the three billion dollar loan that we have obtained from the IMF, which is going to be disbursed over three years. What is clear to me is that if we had started implementing these policies, say, 20 years ago, Ghana would be in a very different situation today. But it is never too late, and we have started, and we will continue. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, given the large amount of gold reserves Ghana has, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Ghana has seven large gold belts, stretching from Axin and Winneba to Nangodi and Laura. According to the Geological Survey Department, the belts cover an area of 43,000 square kilometers, with about 50%, that is 21,000 kilometers, not yet explored. The conservative estimate is that the potential quantum of gold in these unexplored belts is around 5 billion ounces. This has a market value today of 10 trillion US dollars. My government will engage exploration experts 
from the universities and the geological institutions to assist in exploring our seven gold belts. However, if even only 5% of the 5 billion hours estimated materialized, only 5%, it would be a game changer for God. My government will provide the Geological Survey Department and our universities with resources annually to undertake a mapping of areas where we have gold reserves. As a matter of policy, we will legislate that concessions in areas with proven gold reserves that we'll find, 100% of those concessions will be given to Ghanaians and, and, uh, for, for operations. We can easily raise the capital required and hire the expertise once the gold reserves are proven. Our policy will be to build Ghana's gold reserves appreciably to reach a point where we have sufficient gold reserves to keep the, our external payments position sustainably strong. This along with a supportive, with su supportive fiscal discipline will provide long-term stability for the exchange rate of the city and at the same time reduce our dependence on the eurobond market for finance. I believe that the maximization of the benefits from our natural resources will help create jobs, improve livelihoods, and also improve the conditions of service of Ghanaian workers. I now come to industry, industrialization. Ladies and gentlemen, I will continue our policy of industrialization in areas such as agro-processing, cocoa, cashew, share nuts, and so on. Salt, gold, lithium, refining, and manufacture of batteries and automobile assembly in ma and manufacture. And also empower lo the local business sector, especially startups, and SMEs to drive investment and growth in Ghana, thus significantly boosting job creation. We must also protect local industry from smuggled imports that evade import duties. Ladies and gentlemen, special economic zones will be created, these are the free zones, in collaboration with the private sector at Ghana's major border towns, such as Aflao, Haga, Elubu, Sankase, and Tatale to enhance economic activity, increase exports, and reduce smuggling and create jobs. Temaport will be fully automated and benchmarked to be as efficient as some of the best ports in the world like Hong Kong, Singapore, and Dubai. Also, there will be a new policy of ally aligning import duties and charges at the Tema port to the import duties and charges at the Lomi port in Togo. <laughs> which is who are Togo uh, Lomi is our main competitor. This will reduce smuggling and tax avoidance. Also, for spare parts importers, Duties will be at a flat rate per container, 20 foot or 40 foot, and that is what we are going to do. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let us now move to dealing with corruption. I entered politics to serve the nation. My passion is solving problems. My passion is helping the poor, the vulnerable, and the disadvantaged in society. Accumulation of wealth is not and has never been a passion or an ambition. This is why throughout my public life, I have pursued policies, especially through digitalization, to check corruption in places like the ports, the DVLA, the NHIS, the passport office, and the controller and accountant general department. So I have a solid track record in fighting corruption, and I have earned a reputation for doing so. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most potent weapons against corruption is transparency. 
Many, many corrupt activities are cash-based, apart from the obvious economic benefits of moving in the direction of a cashless society. The literature does indicate that the more electronic payments are used in transactions as opposed to cash, the more there is traceability and therefore the less the corruption. I would like to bring Ghana close to a cashless economy in the shortest possible time. So far, the Bank of Ghana has made a lot of progress in this direction by putting in place a lot of the systems and infrastructure required. These include mobile money interoperability, merchant interoperability, the universal QR code system, GH Link, debit cards, e-switch, and Ghana Pay. We have put in place the necessary infrastructure for Ghana to go cashless. Recently, the Bank of Ghana has completed a pilot of a digital version of the Ghana City in Seshiwi also. This is known as the Central Bank Digital Currency, or the ECD. The ECD is designed to work online and offline and will be launched by the Bank of Ghana in due course. In my humble opinion, the ECD with appropriate privacy protections will be the ultimate weapon in our fight against corruption because it will provide transparency, reduce the risk of fraud, robbery, tax avoidance, and money laundering since it will, it will be easy to track the movement of money and identify suspicious activity. The ECD will quicken the pace of Ghana's move towards a cashless or near cashless society. Ladies and gentlemen, to move towards a cashless economy, however, we have to encourage the population to use electronic channels of payment. To accomplish this, under my administration, there will be no taxes on digital payments. The E-11 will therefore be abolished. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Furthermore, to enhance transparency, I will cause to be published online details of all public contracts for public scrutiny. Ladies and gentlemen, in advanced economies, workers are able to easily access credit to purchase basic items such as televisions, cars, and houses. They are able to do so because the credit system works and it is supported by individualized credit scoring by credit rating agencies. In Ghana, a credit system is yet to develop and therefore life is harder for workers. It is my goal to make it easier and cheaper to access credit by leveraging on our data and systems, such as the Ghana card, Ghana Post GPS, mobile money interoperability, DVLA, GRA, the bank accounts, and all those to build an efficient credit system and a mortgage market in Ghana underpinned by individualized credit scoring and the digitalization of land titling and transfer. We look forward to starting individualized credit scoring in Ghana this year and will make it easier for Ghanaians to access credit at lower interest rates. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I believe that as when it comes to a national development plan, I believe we can find broad contours of a national development plan for which we can find consensus in areas such as education, health, industrialization, environment, and so on. I will support a consensus national development plan. Specifically, I will propose to amend Article 87 of the 1992 Constitution, as well as the NDPC Act, Act 7479, to mandate political party manifestos and consequently economic and social policies of government, as well as budgets, to be aligned to the agreed upon broad contours in specific sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, the current constitution was designed mainly for political stability, and it has achieved that. We need to amend it with the help of parliament to align it more for national development. In that context, I am committed to the process to amend the 1992 constitution through extensive public consultation with key emphasis on issues such as ex gratia, the rights of dual citizens, elections of MMDCs to deepen decentralization, empowering institutions while reducing the power of the president. Ladies and gentlemen, I want a Ghana where we place an emphasis on values and doing the right things with the human factor playing its appropriate role in curbing corruption, bribery, crime, dishonesty, and so on. A culture of governance founded on ethical values, transparency, professionalism, and meritocracy to create a modern government machinery that exhibits more intensity and determination to impose order, discipline, and enforce compliance of the rules and regulations that are in place. In this regard, we will have a strong partnership between government and faith-based organizations. The contribution of faith-based organizations, for example, the Catholic Bishop Conference, the Christian Council, Pentecostal Council, and the Muslim Council, in areas such as education, health, infrastructure, youth development, and so on, is very significant and complements government's efforts. And so we are going to have them benefit from many of the incentives that we offer to some of our external development partners. Ladies and gentlemen, I will also have a major focus on policies, tax, and other incentives to increase private and public investment in tourism, the creative arts, and sports. More jobs for more jobs creation. We will build on the year of return, beyond the return and December to Ghana. We will also introduce initiatives such as digital streaming platforms for our artists and tax incentives to make tourism and creative arts a growth pool. Tax incentives will also be provided for film producers and musicians. To boost tourism and job creation, my government will implement an e-visa policy for all international travel visitors to Ghana to enable visas to be obtained in minutes subject to security and criminal checks. Ladies and gentlemen, sports is a multi-million dollar industry, an enabler for the youth. However, we have not realized our full sports potential. And we cannot maximize the full potential of Ghana sports with the same funding model we have operated since independence. My government will therefore prioritize the creation of incentives for corporate sponsorship as a sustainable module of financing sports development and promotion of our national teams, including football, athletics, boxing at all levels. This will take the financial pressure of government and also enable government to redirect more support to other sports disciplines. But government, as part of a broad sports development mission, 
will establish the Ghana Sports Secretariat, which will be an agency under the ministry responsible for sports in collaboration with other such as the Ghana Education Service and Sports Federations. My government will also seek school-level collaboration with international sports bodies like the NBA and the NFL to make an app for these emerging sports in Africa to create more opportunities for our young people. Ladies and gentlemen, we have already tried this with the NFL, the governing body for American football, which agreed to host in Ghana in 2022 the first... <laughs> which, which agreed to host in Ghana in 2022 the first ever NFL flag football in Africa after my engagement with them. This paved the way for 10 young Ghanaians to be selected to the United States to represent Africa in the global NFL tournament last year. Another set of young Ghanaians who were picked after the second NFL Africa football was also held in Ghana last year are currently in the United States to represent Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to build a nation that cares for the interests of the poor and the vulnerable, like persons with disabilities, the aged, street kids, lepers, cerebral palsy patients, and so on, in collaboration with faith-based institutions and the private sector. My government will also focus on special needs. To start with, we will recruit special needs teachers on how to work with special needs students. We will also more language therapists and occupational therapists. Ladies and gentlemen, we have secured visa-free travel to a growing list of countries for the benefit of our citizens and businesses. However, the acquisition of passports by Ghanaians at home and abroad has continued to be difficult for many, even though it has significantly improved. So far, Ghana has about four... ...rolled on the Ghana card, which is also an e-pass. To make it easy for Ghanaians to obtain passports, under my government, any Ghana card holder will only have to pay a fee for a passport. You won't have to apply for a passport when you hold a Ghana card. If you are a holder, Okay, my name is 
Abdurrahim and the medical figure. We look at the very uh, the speech of the vice president of Ghana, and we are hoping most of the people are still on. These are just visible, and it's something that is good. Ideas comes to power. Not covered every sector. It is possible that uh, whatever they say as politicians is something that will come to pass. Mostly we have and we but then sometimes we do not get some of the things to so when power is going to be. But we are hoping that most of the things that are said are positive and they are good things. And we are hoping that we tell the Lord is giving to him, he is able to deliver as he has said. So far, I have spoken about the economy, the contribution, my view, my in conclusion, the choice that in is between Vice President Baumia and former President Mahab. It is between them. We have we have to ask. We have to ask our a number of questions making if you want someone you can trust to innovative and impactful I of a 
your vice president, or perhaps make a mark. I would let you be the judge of that. That I have never been president of this country before. to become one of the most important presidents in Ghana's history. I have outlined anything that should put us on the right path and transform our economy. I know that many of us might be tempted to say that we have had many bright and even brave ideas before, and that will be true. Many will say the problem we have is not of ideas, but implementation. Many will say the problem is I offer only what has guided me throughout my life. Hard work, personal integrity, accountability, and selfless leadership. I am determined to make a difference. And with you, with honesty and integrity, with wisdom and decisiveness, pretty in mind as to what I want to do from day one if you make me president. I will not ask for a honeymoon to cool off and think about what to do. I am prepared and ready to work. Give me the opportunity. You know what I stand for. You know my vision. My vision about your mission. I believe in the ingenuity of the Ghanaian. Together, we in building a progressive society of possibility, open opportunities, and a shared prosperity. Born or poor, from the north, from the south, born Christian or Muslim, a boy or a girl, with support. We can win together. It is possible. Thank you for it. God bless you and God bless our homeland, Ghana. A big round of applause for His Excellency and the leader of the new patriotic party, Mrs. Palmia. Please join your husband on stage. And as they resume their seats, please let's all resume our seats, wherever we may be.